Okay, let's get started. Can I share a complicated story with you? Is that okay? It's a little tricky. Tina says yes. I think I heard maybe one other person, probably was Sinclair. Um, anyway, I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, first, I have to set the scene. Uh, does anyone who either went to college, lived in a college town, remember this like unique phenomenon of college TV? So not watching TV in college, but like your college TV station. Like the one that like the university like pays for, gets somehow, but then like students run it. Yeah, it was a little bit uh, strange, right? So uh, it showed usually student films consistently. So that's like how it kind of had its time. Like, which student film will it show? You know, usually it was some kind of like running around the university, um, quick cuts, maybe captions at the bottom. Like this was what the films were about. Maybe it was artsy scenes that were like on a loop and they just like played. And you wondered like, what does it mean? Like, what is this all about? And then someone with, you know, a, a beret turned to you and said, it's about capitalism. And you were like, okay, like, I guess. Maybe it, it's uh, that there was like this cool kind of vibey, groovy image. And you were like, okay, how does this person go to college with me? I'm not this cool. And somehow they look like they're like a movie star. Um, and sometimes the college station just showed nothing for hours. No matter what the programming said, like it was just this for hours and hours on end. So you guys catch the scene. So one night, I'm out in college, right, going from dorm room to dorm room, asking, like, what's going on tonight? Like, what's going on tonight? Like, what are we going to get into tonight? Like, what are we going to get into tonight? And then, like, it was 2 a.m., and the answer was just, like, nothing. We just were bouncing from room to room, and nothing really happened. So I'm back in my room. I, I turn my TV on in my dorm, and I see, you know, some infomercials from some of the basic channels. I see, you know, Xena Warrior Princess, right, that old stuff. And then I see the college TV station, and it's on, and it seems to be live. And there's a white guy and gal that are there, and I'm like, this is interesting, let me just tune in. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh no, because they're a little messy, they're a little sloshy, they're like slurring some words, right? And I'm tuning in, I'm like, what are they saying? And I think they're making some jokes, but then as I listen in, these jokes are racially offensive. And I'm like, uh, what's going on? So I think, like, what do I do? So I pull out my Motorola Razor. I'm like, look at my still photo. I don't think this is going to capture anything. And so I actually had a, a VHS tape, and I put it in my TV. If you guys don't know a VHS tape, they're these, like, kind of bigger cassettes. I mean, uh, there's a way to record a moving image, right? And so I put it in, and I press record. And so I get some of what they've said. And then finally, it goes off to that you know, little static thing again. So they go offline. I'm like, what did I just see? And did anyone else see this? And then I remember, it's Saturday night at 2 a.m. and I'm watching college TV, so of course no one else saw it. It's probably just me. And so I call this woman, or I, I uh, remember this woman named Adriana, who's my classmate, and she uh, runs the station. She's a Chicana woman from California. I'm familiar with her because we live in the same dorm. Uh, also, uh, because she's involved in some justice and activism circles that I am in. And I say, you know what? We need a place to talk about this. So where are we going to go? There's only one place. AOL Instant Messenger. <laughs> Some of you guys know these sounds. So when I told her what happened, she was absolutely furious. She called me, back on the razor now, if, unless you're kind of wanting to keep up. And she wanted to get some more details. She actually knew the anchors. She knew what they would need to do to get in. It was like, this isn't okay. And she was able to tell me like, that this was completely something that broke protocol, that she would handle it. And then she asked me a question after a little bit of silence. So what are you gonna do with the video? And I actually hadn't thought about that. You know, somehow I got the video, again, why did I have a VHS in college? I don't know, but I put it in and press record. I didn't know what to do with the video. And she said, hey, can I just ask you something? Could I just t talk to these guys? Could I work with them? Um, because I'm furious about this. And I'm gonna go through all the channels that they need to do to get discipline at the network. But yeah, you don't need to turn that into the administration or the newspaper, things that I really hadn't thought about, but all of a sudden were kind of coming to my head. And so I said, okay, 
I trusted Adriana. I knew her anger over what they had done was real. So I said, okay, she handled it. She knew there was a wrong and she had committed to me to make it right. Now, uh, after our aim and razor conversation was shut, um, I was a follower of Jesus at the time. Um, that's the shut. Adriana was a nominal Catholic. I had no idea about those two drunken anchors. Um, wasn't sure about their spiritual background. Never found out more about them. And I honestly don't know if I did the right thing, even right now. But I was glad I did something. So a question for you as you think about that situation. What would you do with the videotape? What if that scene was in a church, like even just a church building? Would you do something different? What if you knew everyone, me, Adriana, those two drunken anchors were trying to follow Jesus and trying to do the work of the church? What would you do with the videotape? Those questions that might be coming up for you, those actions you're thinking about, wondering what you might do or might not do, that's actually what we're going to explore today as we go deeper into our series, Life in the Body. When there's a dispute or a wrong in your life, in your community, in the church, what do you do? What is your first act? What is your muscle memory? What do you do? Paul's sixth chapter and his first letter to the Corinthians starts there with that exact issue. Because apparently people in the early church were taking interpersonal matters and suing one another. Worshiping Jesus in the sanctuary and then throwing down lawsuits on the streets. Paul said this is like the church behaving like the wider culture, like the world around them. The world that wasn't following Jesus. Taking folks to court over disagreements was a court cultural norm in Corinth. 2,000 plus years later, this might remind us of a certain moment, maybe our moment, a certain litigious moment we have in our culture, whether it's the last several weeks, getting updates about a pirate and a mermaid almost every day, with some people, I'm sure, being like, who are these people? What is going on? Like, I don't know these names. Like, why are they in the news? Maybe it's the umpteenth documentary about a failing megachurch. Maybe it's just the latest well-documented cancellation. All of these moves take place in the streets, and it's easy to see, I think pretty easy, how they influence the church and not the other way around. People document. People dramatize. And people drag and amplify. That's what's happening in the streets. Things are getting documented, people dramatize, and people get dragged, and situations get amplified. So evidence is collected, sometimes in secret. We know this as people who collect receipts. Won't ask you if you've done it. I don't need to get your business out there, but we know this happens, right? Maybe it's even happened to us. Oh, that's my text, that's my email. I didn't realize that was gonna go to those people. So there's things that are heavily and well-documented. There's drama. This increases through exaggeration and even lies. And guys, we've all done this, right? Where we take someone aside and we say, you know what happened? They said, what happened? And we go in, right? With our own story, with our own retelling, often talking to someone that's maybe a close friend that how could they say anything other than what we're saying? Maybe it's our own echo chamber, our close friends. Maybe some of them, we even have power over. How could they disagree? And as we forget some of the details, as we get a little bit juicier in the story, we don't go back and fix that at the end. We don't clean up the Wikipedia page and say, well, actually, that wasn't true, and I didn't say it like that, and they didn't say it like that. We just go in, don't we? And then people take the evidence and drama to the court of public opinion, almost always starting with folks that are likely to agree with them, and they amplify the conflict, sharing information with others that have even less context than they do, with little or no hope for restoration. The conflict is amplified and the hope for restoration is diminished, and reconciliation was often not even on the table in the first place. Does this sound like the world or the church? 
Yes. Document. Dramatize. Drag and amplify. The integrity of the body of Christ is in such bad shape that this formula can pass as justice. Indeed, sometimes this formula is the closest thing to justice because all other options for wholeness in the body are taken off the table. Something about this doesn't feel right to me. Our options feel too limited here. The church gets too stuck too fast when these are our only moves. Doesn't feel like there's that freedom, right, that Paul has been talking about and will talk about. As Paul will say later in our study of 1 Corinthians 13, let's let him and let's let God show us a more excellent way. Would you join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you be with us as you teach us a new way, Jesus? A way of love, a way of honor, a way of freedom, a way that's still justice. Show us a way, because we need a way out, God, of the ways that we're currently stuck in broken patterns, in cycles that belong to our culture, in ways that we treat one another. Holy Spirit, would you come and have your way here amongst us? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul's going in, in his own way. It's always funny that Paul talks about people going in as he goes in. But hey. So this is sandwiched, this um, a session uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, it's uh, verses 1 through 6. It's sandwiched between these strong exhortations from Paul about sexual ethics and sexual integrity. We can dive deeper to that more in Tuesday's Bible study. Paul says this in this kind of first part of 6. You can follow along up here. When any of you has a grievance against another, do you dare to take it to the court before the unrighteous instead of taking it before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels to say nothing of ordinary matters? If you have ordinary cases, then do you appoint as judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to decide between one believer and another, but a believer goes to court against a believer and before unbelievers at that? This is Paul doing his best like rap battle diss, maybe like more Hamilton style, maybe more like, I don't exactly know the genre of the rap battle, but he's trying, right? Like, church, you're going to judge Gabriel and Michael in the end, and you can't even judge a game of Uno that got too heated right now? This doesn't make sense. Church, God gives you a spirit of wisdom, but you can't judge even the most ordinary of grudges. Church, you're going to let someone outside of the church who doesn't believe that we were created in God's image, saved by grace, joined in one spirit, in one baptism, in one resurrection, decide who's right between you and your home group leader? You're going to do that? You got anybody wise? Anybody. Or do you really need this judge in Connecticut appellate court to figure this mess out? Is that how you look right now, church? Is that your standing? Paul sees the church document, dramatize, drag, and amplify one another in front of the watching world. And he sees a church that's lost its inheritance, that's lost its way. This inheritance is not for aiding and abetting wrong, or keeping negative peace, or getting one another off the hook through the horror of enablement. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's trying to you know, uh, advertise here. I know it might seem close sometimes, but Paul really does want justice in the church, right relationship in the church. And he thinks it's a real possibility versus just having legal entanglements before the watching world. Paul actually sees the weakened church not able to bring justice, not able to bring righteousness, not able to bring peace to even the most ordinary of matters. This is a church that doesn't know how to pursue healthy conflict with one another. They can't do that in the sanctuary, so what do they do? They throw down lawsuits in the streets. Does that sound familiar? Maybe it's to some of your experiences in the church in the past. Maybe even some of your experience in the church now. Sometimes I wonder how much small and ordinary conflict went unaddressed, leading to people feeling their only way was a lawsuit in public. I'm going to say that one more time. Sometimes I wonder how much small and ordinary conflict, the kind that you and I get in all the time, 
how that conflict went unaddressed, leading people to feel their only way out was a lawsuit in public. And maybe it did indeed get to that place where the legal arrangement was eventually needed in someone's eyes, but I wonder where did it start? And was the context they were in healthy enough to have that kind of conflict? If we're going to judge angels in the end, maybe we need to learn, lean into some healthy conflict resolution in the here and now. Like if that's our future together, maybe there's some things that need to be changed about our present. After all, it's easy to cheer for injustice or to cheer against injustice or value peace or chant a trendy slogan for things being made right. It's another thing to back it up with wisdom and courageous action in the church. Sometimes our words in the church are real good. We got real good words, but where are our actions? Even secular movements not based in church are finding it difficult to move from trendy slogans to concrete action that moves towards wholeness. Want an example? Like, take the abolish the police movement. As you chant the slogan, pretty soon you realize, if there are no police, then the rest of us have to deal with people who are inclined to break the law for their own gain. To some folks' credit, they're so committed to that ideal that they're learning practices of restorative justice, of peacemaking, and how to keep vulnerable folks in neighborhoods safe without engaging the police. Now, hear me right, as much as any of us might agree or disagree with this strategy, it's so striking to me that some of that crowd know we can't stay with a slogan. A slogan won't save us. A slogan won't get us what we need in the end. They know they need to move beyond a chant. And some of them are doing real work to make a different world possible as they see it. Otherwise, their chant rings hollow. Honest question, are these folks looking to the church for help in conflict resolution, in peacemaking, in restorative justice? I think we know the answer to that. So are we as the church receiving wisdom from God in order to bring justice to one another and resolve conflict in the church and the world? Or do we do our own version, our own version in the church of shallow chanting? Do the lyrics we sing move us any closer to real peace or true justice or healthy conflict? Or are we just all doing sing-alongs here? Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. What do our actions look like? Spirit, break out. Break our walls down. I want to love the things you love. I want to hate the things you hate. As your heart is formed inside us, may we learn to walk in grace and extend the hand of mercy to set the captives free, bringing freedom to the prisoner, bringing hope the blind can see. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We say, yes, Lord. Or maybe this kind of classic. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. What are the purposes of these songs, of these lyrics, if they're not transforming us at best, and if we're rejecting them with our actions at worst? Paul exhorts us to a new way that's very different than public lawsuits in the streets or on social media. Maybe that's more relevant for us. But it's very costly, this new way. He details it in 7 and 8. In fact, to have lawsuits at all with one another as the body of Christ is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud and believers at that. Paul says the ultimate L is not being wrong. The ultimate loss is not being wrong, but it's having public lawsuits among believers in the first place. That's the real thing. That's the loss. That's the real thing. That's the nightmare. That's the real thing that makes the church lose its inheritance. For us in our everyday, this might not be lawsuits or a legal arrangement, but what if it's instead public spectacles? of irreconcilable conflicts. Public spectacles of irreconcilable conflicts. Now, did I just describe, you know, social media and our practices of it? Maybe. Paul's way out. Why not be wronged? Why not be wronged? It hurts. It makes us uncomfortable. It stings. It makes us feel less than. 
It makes us believe lies about ourselves, that we aren't God's beloved or chosen. For some reason, being wrong makes us just feel like we're under a stone, even though it seems like it might be godly admission for us to be there. But it's hard for us to hold those things together. Why does this make us uncomfortable? Because the church can often be nice and not kind. The church can be a place of pushovers where real wrong is taking place. The church can be a place not for exposing sin, but getting away with it. Why would we want to practice being wronged in that environment? We don't want to contribute to a culture where things get swept under the rug, especially in the church of God. That's not the integrity nor the wholeness that Paul is calling us towards. That's true. Here's the thing, though. Paul doesn't say, why not be okay with something that you won't even call a wrong? Paul says, call it a wrong. Name it as wrong. Be open to make a play where you will be wronged, though, and abstain yourself from wrongdoing or defrauding others throughout. This is countercultural. The world documents, dramatizes, drags, and amplifies. But the church, God's church, this church, has another way. I'm going to share three of those ways as we walk through this message together. The first is be defined yourself in naming the wrong. The second is draw near to the offender. And the third is be willing to be wronged, to take the loss, a phrase we've used at ECV, in love for the sake of wholeness. Be defined in naming the wrong, draw near to the offender in ways that you're able to, and become willing to be wronged, to take the loss in love for the sake of wholeness and the integrity of the body. So let's walk through this together. We can de be defined in naming the wrong. We can say what's so for us. We can just speak out of our own experiences. Sometimes we feel in the church we couldn't do that. We have to be nice. We have to soften things up. That's not true. We can say, this is the wrong. We can name it. We can keep short accounts and do that in a timely way so people aren't guessing, well, six years ago, when, what did I say again? But it's, oh, at, oh, I said that today. I said that this past week. Thanks for sharing that with me. We can be defined in that. I actually see I'm very encouraged that I feel like our church is growing in this. It's very exciting to me. I, I see the ways that as we do the Blessing Generation series and get a little bit clear on, oh, actually there are some different feelings and experiences we have in our church. People are saying, hey, got, uh, got a Gen 3 concern over here. Just, right, can you, uh, hey, I've been Gen 1 and I've, I've just noticed something. I'm seeing us have some deeper conversations. It's really exciting to me. Or our nonviolence work as people say, hey, I'm going to get curious first. I'm puzzled. Like, what did you mean when you said that? Oh, I was worried about that. Can, can we talk about that? I'm actually seeing it, honestly, just I'm not going to uh, say anything more specific than this, but it's in my inbox a little bit. I'm like, oh, this is, people have got, people are email, they're talking to me. This is great. Like, it's a hard thing for me, but it's a good thing. I'm like, we're practicing this. This is really helpful because we can take things in. We can weigh and test them. We can ponder over these things, even with mentors and leaders. Someone said this about me. I just need to weigh that with you just as a safe person for me. But, oh, you, you see that too? Okay, I need to go and take ownership then. We can point out ways that even we've been wronged and work on it together. So this is actually, I think, called the church. <laughs> Naming wrong confessing sin, pointing things out about where we've failed, and gently, kindly saying, I think this might be a place where you need to take ownership. We've got to do that work in the church instead of just being nice. Nice doesn't cut it, and it often looks over things that eventually become bigger and bigger and bigger issues. We've got to name the wrong and know that we can be defined in doing that. We can show up as our full selves and do that. We also need to draw near to the offender where we're able to. We don't go to others only, like sideways. Has that ever happened where it's like, hey, I need to just talk to you about this situation with this person, and I really need to talk to you because you're not them. <laughs> and so I'm going to be helped by just chatting with you. We do that a lot. Sometimes it's called like triangling, right? Bringing someone person in that doesn't have to be in at all. And it makes us feel better. 
that direct confrontation, it can be hard for us. And I, I want to suggest something that has really been helpful for me as I've tried to grow in these things. Uh, sometimes we think, I just can't have that conversation with that person. And we're like, okay, that, that's fine. Okay, let's just start, start here. What if we just wrote something out right now as if you were going to talk to them? Or well, let's role play, I'll be that person. And they're like, no. But, but wait, I'm, I'm not that person, and that's just a piece of paper. I said, no. Okay, let, let me just kind of lean in a little bit. Like, the person's not here. They actually live in a different state. But, like, sometimes we're just unable to be in conversation with someone that's hurt us. Like, even theoretically, there's something in our own healing where we're not even there yet. And I've been so helped by people challenging me. Josh, calm down. <laughs> Take it slow. I need you to actually write, what would you say to that person? Can you name the wrong? And as I've even imagined doing that, not even writing down, even, as I've even imagined doing that, I felt something change in my heart and in my spirit. Because I realized, oh, it's possible for me to not just be angry, to not just be upset, to not just feel taken advantage of, but to feel like I have words, actually. Words that matter. Words that I may or may not say, but now they're coming to me. That's been so helpful for me to do that work of drawing near to the offender in the ways I'm able, which sometimes isn't a conversation that day, but it can be an imaginative work with a friend or with prayer, even writing something out physically and then saying, I'm not sure if I'm gonna send this, but writing it actually helps. And sometimes, y'all, the Spirit will tell us that is something to share and we'll have to follow courageously. Lastly, become willing to be wronged, to take the loss in love for the sake of wholeness. At some point, we discern whether we can just be wronged and still be whole, though, ourselves and whole as a body, to have integrity as a body, as opposed to being right, but being alone. At some point, we have to discern whether we can be wronged and still be whole, to still exist in a body, to still value the integrity of the body with God and with others, as opposed to being right and being alone. Being wronged looks different, and it's not one size fits all. It's really not. I think the best way to share this is just through sharing like two examples, just real quick, that just come from my life. Um, again, hopefully I'm not getting too complicated, too messy, or hopefully that's helpful if I am doing those things, and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, last year, I was in a ministry situation where I was on a big call of people, uh, and the person was talking about some, you know, ministry somewhere. I actually forget, because what happened next was a little bit more memorable for me. I think the person slipped up a little bit and said, hey, so as we're talking about, you know, colored people, this is something where I'm like, what? And then they just said, colored people, and then said it again. I was like, this person did not know what they were saying. Oh, no. And as I thought about that, and I was just kind of like, oh, this feels so awkward. And guess how many black people were on the call? Anyone? Anything? Oh, you got the one. Yep, you got it. You get a special prize later, right? There was one other person of color on the call. And I just thought, this is so weird. It feels bad to me. And I didn't even have the thoughts to do my nonviolence work. My nonviolence people over here, it just, that part of my brain just turned off. I was like, this just feels embarrassing. Um, and I, I did think after the call, though, okay, that was, I was wrong. That was, a, I, I, I don't feel good about that. But I honestly thought about that person. They were uh, of uh, advanced age. You know, people of color has been a term that's a little new. Like, there's, there's ways I can lean in a little bit, right? Um, and I was like, you know what? I actually know this person's heart. I don't feel like I need to spend my time on that. I, I don't. That's personally how I felt. I was like, why not be wrong? And then keep pushing. But then something happened that was a little weirder. Bing, 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 bing. In my text message. In my DMs on Zoom. Like, did you see? Did you hear? Josh, he said colored people. He said colored people. Josh, you're black. He said colored people. He said, I was like, yes, I did hear. I am black. And he did say that. And why are you up in my inbox with all these things? That made me feel not good. See, Andrew's got it, right? One thing was okay for the why not be wrong. The other thing, I'm like, I'm going to have to talk about this. And so I went backwards, got some peace because I was a little heated. And then I talked to a black mentor and friend of mine. And I said, actually, I feel good about starting some conversations. Still with that why not be wrong, because did I have a lot of hope those conversations would go well? I didn't. But I said, hey, I just need to tell you something. When you came to me that way, I need to ask a question first. Did you talk to the person who said that? I already knew the answer, but I, to practice nonviolence, I have to not know for a little bit, and that's actually good. They said no. 
I said, then it feels weird to me that you would go to me versus going to them. Because actually, I was embarrassed, so I couldn't do that. Like, I lost some motor function. I lost some ability to think. But you might have had it because you instantly kind of came to me. But I need you to go to them. I need you to ask them, hey, that, wh- why did you say that? Or did you mean to say that? And that you can kind of see like, their eyes open a little bit. But I don't think, honestly, they really got it. But that was really important for me to name the wrong. One thing I totally was fine being like, why not be wronged? The other thing, I had to name that. But I still felt, why not be wrong? Because I just kind of guessed it wasn't going to go super well. And it, it didn't. But it was good for me to do, to be defined, to name the wrong, to be connected, and to be open just with that, why not be wronged? And I still have good relationships with those folks, but it was important for my own growth. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip the second story. If you want to talk to me afterwards, you can. It was a good story, but I shouldn't. I should skip it. It's worth it. It's worth it, y'all, to be defined and connected in the face of wrongdoing. It really is. It keeps our body whole. It keeps relationships active. We don't have to lose ourselves in doing it. We can actually be defined. We can be with, and we must be open must be open to being wronged. If you haven't caught it yet, this is the gospel. Even though we were dead in our sins, Jesus came to save us and make us whole. Even as we seek to follow Jesus, we turn from God, but God never fully turns away from us. God is defined in his holiness, but he's connected to us in his love. This can be the good news the church brings to the world if we were only courageous enough to practice it in the ordinary spaces. In as Paul says, those trivial matters. Because I think, right, with Paul, we're supposed to judge angels someday. So can we get to work now with lesser matters? Can we give up our lawsuits? Can we commit to documenting for righteousness, not to be right? Can we commit to moving towards the offender versus dramatizing the situation with a bystander or our favorite echo chamber? Whatever friend, Facebook group, kind of social media clan. Can we actually just give that up? Can we commit not to drag people in the streets, but instead to go to God in the sanctuary where we've been wronged and receive strength from God? And maybe God alone, at least for a while. This isn't about giving up on justice. It's about admitting how many issues are actually just about us and our ego and the ways that we have kind of a petty argument with someone, the ways that we actually are focused more on our own story than the wholeness and integrity of the body. Remember that being defined lets us name the wrong. Remember, apparently, you're going to judge angels someday, so you can name the wrong and receive God's wisdom. Remember that drawing near includes the space of our hearts, not just real-time connection, but those spiritual practices we can do to get close to what it would mean to say, here's what I would want to say. If I had the space, if I didn't feel threatened, if I wasn't going to get caught up, what would I say? to the person who's hurt me. We can do that work even in our own imagination, even in our journal, perhaps if God calls us with that person. And remember, being alone and right is worse than being wronged and finding wholeness in the body as God honors you for lowering yourself, as we'll learn about more in 1 Corinthians, as God says there's people that have special honor, people we prioritize and prefer. I think often those are the ones that find themselves being wronged more. This is life in the body for someone who will judge angels one day. I want to see the world looking at how the church resolves conflict to inspire their own moves towards peacemaking and conflict resolution. This has happened before, y'all. Things like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa that was designed by Desmond Tutu and other theologians. The church's leadership in the nonviolence movement in the U.S., in the 60s, and even local peacemaking work. We were just talking about this on staff this past week. People uh, that are involved in Upon This Rock Ministries that are getting together with people that are in different gangs and saying, let's actually come and reason together. Partners we have like Ice the Beef that also has faith roots. They're doing this work even in our city, even today. The church can be a place where we name wrongs, draw near to the offender in the pursuit of justice and restoration and even take the loss and be wronged when need be. But it can only be that if we give up the ways of the world, the comforts that a lawsuit 
or public spectacle can bring. The ways that we feel seen and known when we talk to an echo chamber that sometimes isn't even really modeling being a real person. We just get like a familiar kind of clap back. We can only really grow when we give that up and also give up the ways of cowardice and step into the courage of possibly being wronged and being with God in that place. Few invitations. The first, examine your habits when you are wronged and bring them to God. Is it anger? Is it a quick call to a friend for a rant or event? Is it going to the internet, the social media street? Just observe your habits. Don't judge yourself, just observe them and then bring them to God for him to speak. Write a letter to an offender this week, even if you have no plan to send it. Actually pick someone that's hurt you, that's hurt people you love, and write them. If it's too hard to write down, just think about it. Take a place of pausing or silence. Again, no pressure to send, but see what happens to your heart. I believe something will happen. And then practice taking the loss with God's support. I'd encourage you to start with something like, very low. For me, this might be taking the loss with Zoe or Joy and my daughter. Is like, start like uh, in, <laughs> start in a, in a simple way. Don't, don't do the hardest thing yet. I'm going to invite the worship team up. I want to invite the Spirit's work here in a deeper way. Because I feel like the only way forward for us with this is to have the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, would you come right now with your power? Let's just wait on your spirit. seems to have this kind of assumption that being together helps the body. Seeing one another helps the body. We're not wronged alone, but we get to be people that say we will be wronged, but be in community together. It's actually possible that two parties might feel they've been wronged together, but in the body, they could admit that and receive healing. And so, I want you right now to think maybe of this past week, this past month, and to think, is there an experience where you may have been wronged? And you're curious, you're open to that call, why not be wronged? That might be where you are, curiosity. those people in the room right now. And I pray for the Spirit to come upon them because the Spirit honors those who have been lowered and gone low. The Spirit honors those who have been hurt and those who are opening up their hurt to Jesus for healing. So Holy Spirit, would you come with your power right now, specifically for those who feel wronged, they've been wronged, and they're curious, what would it mean just to be wronged? To, to not fight back, but to instead seek healing, justice, restoration in the body of Christ. Holy Spirit, come. Let's wait a little bit longer just for the Holy Spirit to minister to those folk. And if you feel the Holy Spirit doing something in you, that the Lord's ministering to you, feel free to stand up so people can just extend a hand. Or maybe it's just lifting up your hand, people can extend a hand towards you. We want to support one another in the body.
Holy Spirit, pour out your spirit. Pour out your power. Give folk right now the strength to be with you in their hurt, to be with you in their pain. Would you help us come alongside these ones right now so we can honor and lift them up? Pour out your power, Lord.